Oh gosh, look at the crowd. Come this way. Those who spread goodness radiate happiness to everyone around them. Introducing LOLC Finance Credit Cards. Fuel the goodness in you. Welcome to LMD TV. I'm Rashmi Velakan and joining me on Talking Business is Gillian Edwards. Welcome to the show, Gillian. It's good to have you with us. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Gillian, in your opinion, how has the SME sector weathered the storm, so to speak? The SME sector, I would say, is still reeling after the aftermath of the storm. Because this sector, as we all know, is very vulnerable. And if we look back just a couple of years ago, we see that in 2016 and 17, we had a lot of natural disasters. Then no sooner that was over and things were just getting back to normal, then came the Easter Sunday attacks, which caused a lot of damage, as we all know. And that again, before we really recovered from that disaster totally, here comes the pandemic. So I would say it is one upon the other and um, there's a lot to be done yet to, for the revival of this sector. Now, uh, in terms of, uh, from the government of Sri Lanka, in terms of support, there have been a lot of uh, fundings that have come in. We saw the COVID-19 uh, renaissance facilities coming across, helping this particular sector. And uh, banks also on their own have come up with their own funding lines and facilities that they made available once again to get this sector up and running. When you look at this sector, they need a lot of hand holding, right? And you cannot fund them in isolation. I believe that, and I'm sure all my colleagues across the board will agree that it is a partnership. Especially, you have got to walk the talk with the SMEs. When we look back at the sectors, right, the tourism, of course, was the most badly affected. Right? First came the Easter Sunday attack, and no sooner we were recovering, then comes the COVID. So when we, that particular sector is still to recover, and uh, with the tourism sector, there's so much of other integrated businesses that are affected. So it's more, more or less like a domino effect across the board. And, um, but the good thing also is we are beginning to live in the new norm and we can see tourists coming into the country in the new norm in keeping with the new, new health guidelines. Then the other sector that was badly affected was, as we know, the apparel sector. And uh, we saw so many, uh, there again, when you take the apparel, uh, we will talk about the small and micro, right? And the small were really doing subcontracts. Now the big players in the field could somehow or another cut salaries and, and somehow or another survive. But when you came, when you were talking about the smaller industries, they are the ones that were so badly hit because they are doing subcontracts for the main. Then we have a lot of micro entrepreneurs that who stitch at home and supply, and supply to the local market. Now the whole April season was lost. So we, these, these um, entrepreneurs at their stocks at home, no way to sell. And with that we saw a lot of job losses, right? Some of them, some businesses had to, the sad part of it, had to totally wind down. Right. And then there are other sectors like gem and jewelry, leather, you know, there is a number of sectors that were badly affected. But then on the flip side of the coin, there are sectors that were not that badly affected. For instance, agriculture. With the first lockdown and the second lockdown, the agriculture continued, fisheries continued. And uh, wholesale and retail trade somehow or another, even through the, through the lockdown periods, they continue with business and we talk about the, we can talk about the FC GMs, right? And they also, well, those are wanted goods. So people, anyway, distribution and manufacturing will take place. I know so many factories that, with, despite during lockdown, look, during lockdowns they functioned to enable their goods to be got across. Then the health care. So IT. Right, telecom, 
those are the area industries and areas that somehow now the survived and some of them even thrived in this new norm as what we call it right so the in a nutshell i would say yes uh, we have gone we have had a rocky road but sri lanka is a very resilient country right and i have every confidence that we will bounce back it's not going to happen overnight but we'll de we are definitely on the road to recover do you think enough is being done for the SME sector in terms of financial literacy? Well, financial literacy is a subject by itself for SMEs. And uh, it's very unfortunate that I would say that we do not have enough financial literacy across the board. Uh, when you talk about financial literacy, one means that you have to have the knowledge of money and financial products and basically how to use this money how to use the funds to get your business off the ground mm -hmm. and after manage your business. So there is a budgeting, planning, controlling, then how you source your funds. You have to be savvy with terms of interest rates, then you have to manage your risk, you have to have contingency funding and your most important is insurance which we hardly hear of today. So it's a whole gamut put together. Right. And unfortunately, when we look at our, okay, if we talk about financial planning, I would say the medium term and a good part of the small enterprises, they have some sort of knowledge. The mediums have good knowledge and the small have, have somewhat, oh, I would say, mediocre knowledge. But when we look at the micros, right, now that is where the problem lies. Right, and if you take the, it's sad to say, but education qualifications also matter. Right, so when you have studied, uh, some of them have done all levels, some of them unfortunately have not done those. Right, even and then they tend to struggle. And they always think about when you talk about financials, uh, funding, they would only think about getting the loan. They won't worry about the cost of it. They don't see go sourcing for funds. They don't shop around look at things such as interest rates right and the other important factor is bookkeeping right they don't have financials so how do they go to banks to borrow so those are the fundamental problems that we see across the board now all banks right and even if you take government organizations and then the funding agencies that have come in have worked very hard right to uplift this standard now i know at dfcc we have number of programs across the board now dfcc has been with the development banking history for over 65 years and we have been involved in financial literacy uplifting their knowledge as much as possible having workshops and consultancies so but it's very unfortunate that we cannot reach everybody there's a huge segment out there now if you look at the SMEs and the micros 75% of them are in rural so how do how do we get to them it's the biggest problem that we have then from their side what do they do they go to the easiest source of funding that is the informal sector. They borrow at very high risk, uh, high rates. And unfortunately, when it comes to, uh, they cannot service those borrowings, and they wind up. So that is a way. That is the that is a sad story that we have been seeing repeating over and over again. And yes, there is much to be done in this area. Sri Lankan seem to have a lot of ideas, but when it comes down to implementation, do you see the drive needed to get things done? Yes, there's a lot of ideas, a lot of enthusiasm, right? But it is a two-way street. Now, when we look at it from the SME's point of view, what we see is, right, they need to have proper planning, right? And they have to have a business plan, they have to have a feasibility study, carried out, they have to have a good idea of what they're going in for and uh, how you source your raw materials, where are you going to get your labor fund, how are you going to market your product. So, but there again we go back to that old haunting question where they only look at funding. 
right? And then finding it very important, but there are other areas too that they need to focus on. So that is where financial literacy also plays a huge role, right? And then we also also see that they have a, a vacuum where knowledge is concerned with regard to all the registrations, the local authority requirements, so that those gaps need to be addressed from the side of the uh, SMEs and the micro. Then, it, as I said, it was two-way street, so maybe we go to the regulators, right? So we, they, they, we have to have proper R&D, right? And when an idea is generated, we should be able to guide them to make those ideas finally ideas be turned into a feasible venture. Right? And then we have to have the necessary enabling environment. Right? Now, this is something that is a, a cause that is very close to my heart is we've got to champion the local entrepreneurs. We have got to believe and start patronizing. Right. Be Sri Lankan, made, uh, wear Sri Lankan, consume what is made in Sri Lanka. Right. So those are, that is something that, we, anyway, the good thing is it's something that we're seeing happening a lot. After the pandemic, we saw a lot of import restrictions. Right. So some may grumble, but there are certain, that a lot of the domestic industry gets protected by it. There's so much of opportunities that we see that the domestic industry coming forward. So we as Sri Lankans, right, are very comfortable to buy things overseas. We tend to prefer to have the imported goods. We may go for something inferior. None of us take the time really when we walk along the shelves, so instance in the supermarket to pick up an item and see whether it's really made in Sri Lanka. So that attitude has to change, right? And we have to be proud that we are Sri Lankans, proud to use and consume what is made in Sri Lanka. Then we would talk about the environment. They need the, the entrepreneurs, or if you're going into a new business, you have to get the proper environment, uh, regulated, the proper registrations before you start a venture. Right? And then we, they need to be educated into the marketing angle. Like that, for instance, is overseas, how you source overseas market. That is where the EDB plays a huge role, right, in sourcing and they will take your products onto their websites, right, and the foreign missions will get involved and we create those marketing avenues and opportunities that the entrepreneur needs, right. And then again we get back to the funding, right, funds needs to be accessible, it needs to be easily accessible, right, and we have to educate them again on the funding lines and the various loan schemes that they that is made available. So in a nutshell, yes, I would say it's a two-way street, right? And it works both ways. How does collateral work when it comes to financing SMEs and entrepreneurs? When it comes to financing SMEs and entrepreneurs, for banks the most important is the viability of the business the soundness of the business and the ability to generate cash flows to service the debt is most important. Uh, although SMEs on the other hand, you know, tend to always think that, okay, I need to have a collateral to go to the bank. Right? So it doesn't work that way. But when it comes, as you all know, banks are custodian of public funds and we have got to manage the risk. So it, we need to create a balance in between. Now when we look at some of the SMEs and the micros that come in, they are very new to the business. They don't have any financials. So banks have to construct their financials and go through all their records. They don't have banking statements. They don't route their money through banks. They've got all these fear psychosis that is within them that were sometimes, they prefer to keep the money at home, right? Then especially the micros, and they are 99% home-based. So they have very little, and they are operating from home, they have even less access to banks. So this, this is one of the reasons, 
right that banks also have to manage their risks in terms of the micros and the SMEs. And then who have found there is also a fierce like psychosis as I said. Most of the SMEs and the micros think that, that just because you mortgage a property to a bank to get a loan that you are going to lose your property. Right? And it's a lot based on word of mouth, hearsay. So that they are, this fear is within them thinking they are going to lose their property and then again they prefer to you know go to the informal sector. And finally the business also ends up in shambles because they can't afford the funding cost of the informal sector. And uh, as I rightly said, we, it all depends on the viability of the business. Right? So it is not only collateral based on anything that we do. And uh, for instance, we have other products. We take leasing, where the bank has absolute ownership. If it's a vehicle, we have absolute ownership over the asset. And leasing has been a backbone in funding SMEs. Right? And what we see is, they, we give them, okay, we fund one effort. They pay it over a period of four years and they, they have that is a, uh, a ready asset available for them. They can dispose of it, increase their cash flows. So I wouldn't say that banks are 100%, everything revolves around core at all, right? And uh, we are not in the property business. The last thing that a bank would want to do is foreclose on somebody's asset. And when we take it over, it is an unwanted hassle for us. But then again, getting back to what I mentioned previously is we got to manage the risk. We are custodians of public funds. So we have to strike a balance in between and advice is if they plan their business, if they SMEs plan their businesses, they register their businesses properly, right? Then and they have financial literacy, they prepare their accounts and they have a viable project, a bank will definitely fund them. And on that note, we'll be back after a short break. Welcome back to the show as we continue our conversation with Gillian Edwards. Gillian, from what you know, how successful was the government's Saubagia scheme? The government's Saubaga scheme was a most welcome lending hand to the SMEs at a time of need. Right? And there was a huge number of applicants that benefited by this loan scheme. As we all know, it was lent out at 4% with a maximum of cap of 25 million. It, you got a repayment period, it was basically for working capital. Repayment period of 24 months and also a grace period. So with this Saubagya, what we found out was it kick-started the lending process. We saw the private sector credit grow in the months of September and October. And yes, it started the ball rolling and with that we saw the individuals coming in and the lending happening in banks, right? So I would say all in all, it was successful. But on the other hand, again, if we go to the micros, right they did not have proper banking records i mean they were not having any financials so those were the unfortunate stories which could not benefit from the saubagya scheme but i would say overall it was a success are banks provisioning for NPLs, and if so are they higher than the norm yes of course Right, as uh, I think the NPLs were managed very well in the years of 2016, 17, 18, we saw very low numbers. Right, but with the Easter Sunday attack, right, and we saw the numbers beginning to rise in 2019 and 2020, of course, right, was not a great year in terms of NPL numbers. But then I would say that it's not only restricted to Sri Lanka, it is a global problem. Right? And we saw the NPLs really rise across globally. So when you talk about, it was not all industries there. 
I said the, the high stress or the high risk industries like where we saw the tourism. Lots of moratoriums were given. We had phase one, we had phase two in the moratoriums for the, two, uh, for the tourism and we are sure to see the third round of extensions. Then we saw the garment industry affected. So when the, there was, banks have done a lot of restructuring. The last thing that a bank would want to do is see a business go under. So what we do is we restructure, we give nurturing facilities and somehow or another try to get this SME going, right? But there are certain unfortunate stories which cannot be restructured. What policies would you say need to be brought in to assist the banking fraternity in engaging with the rural communities and having them be interested in what's being offered? Right. As I said previously, 75% uh, of the SMEs originate from rural and 24 from urban. So what we need and what the central bank has started working to is prior to sector lending. Right. So we have to identify the sectors that have high return and that have a lot of room for growth. Right? And we have banks have to focus on those sectors and ensure that we make the necessary funding of funds available to them. And then it involves guiding, monitoring, as I said, hand holding. So when we fund SMEs, it is a partnership. So banks have to invest a lot in it. So getting back to, yes, the, the question priority sector lending is a must, I think, to, if we are to move forward. And priority sector lending is nothing new for the whole region. It's there in India. We see it in Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, with a lot of focus on agriculture and industry. Does rapid digitization actually help those in our rural areas where connectivity is still low? Digitalization is good and we learned the value of that during the pandemic. It taught banks to do business in a completely different manner. We could not bear when we could not open branches. We have to enable our customers to do transactions digitally. So I'm not saying that it's it's needed and it's a way forward. But when you look at the SMEs and the micros, considering the fact that they are based in a rural community, and when we look at the business model, we need a lot of hand-holding. So brick and mortar branches are necessary. We need to have officers who, can, who will guide these SMEs, who will work with them in partnership. And uh, again, connectivity. Getting the SMEs, especially the micros, onto smartphones to enable their business. Because when you give a loan to an SME, it is just not crediting the account and you know expecting the SME to pay it back at the end of the day. It doesn't happen that way. It is a journey. So in a digital environment, have, you know, facilitating that journey, giving them the guidance they need and uh, all the, the services that a bank has to provide, totally digital is not going to work. So we, we can work in a hybrid where we offer them the digital services as well because we, have, we deal through a wide spectrum when you look at the generation. Right, there is the older generation who are not familiar with the digital. Right? And then you get the younger entrepreneurs who really want to go digital. So banks have to facilitate both. And at this juncture, we would recommend a hybrid model. The brick and mortar branches have to continue. Right? Because of the hand holding and the, and the assistance that we have to provide the SMEs throughout their journey. And that's all the time we have for this segment. Thank you for joining us this evening, Gillian. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. Coming up, we have the latest from Sri Lanka's Manufacturing and Exports Reports. Stay tuned. You love the feeling of being renewed. To stay beautiful every single day. To breathe just like we do. Because you are truly delicate. Protecting the ones who've been with us through the years with Sailac Care.
the only wood coating that truly protects you. Salak Wood Coatings from Jat. Welcome back to the show and now let's take a look at the island's exports and manufacturing report. Sri Lanka's Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index or PMI reached a 9-month high as activities continue to recover backed by production and new orders according to the central bank which compiles the index. These significant increases in the new orders and production sub-indices particularly in the manufacture of food and beverages and textile and wearing apparel sectors, have mainly contributed to the improvement in the overall index, the statement says. Many respondents in the manufacture of food and beverages sector stated that they observed higher levels of sales and production in March ahead of the New Year festival season. Furthermore, respondents from the textile and wearing apparel sector mentioned that they have increased production during the month to cover the seasonal holidays. Although shipping related issues gradually eased, freight rates were still high. The manufacturing PMI climbed to 67 in March from 59.4 in February, while the services PMI also climbed to 62.1, rising 5.6 points from 56.5. New businesses in the services sector increased in March, particularly in the improvements observed in financial services, other personal services and the wholesale and retail trade subsectors, says the central bank. For the fourth consecutive month, business activities in the services sector increased in March with the improvements observed across almost all subsectors. The financial services subsector recorded a further improvement during the month in line with the progress of economic activities. With the festive season, the wholesale and retail trade and transportation subsectors also expanded. Employment in the services sector increased for the first time in March after declining 13 consecutive months due to new recruitments amidst growing business activities. Expectations for business activities for the next three months increased in March, underpinned by the optimistic outlook for growth prospects amid the Singala and Tamil New Year and Ramadan festive seasons. And that's all we have for this week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching and stay safe.